Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Housing Forum this evening. So glad to see everybody here tonight and looking forward to a robust presentation and dialogue uh, for Q&A um, about the housing draft plan. Um, I wanna thank staff Kelly Linema, the Assistant Director of the Department of Planning and Community Development, the Housing Plan Implementation Committee, as well as our consulting team, Barrett Planning Group and Horsley Witten Group who are here this evening and who will be making the bulk of the presentation. So tonight um, we are starting a little bit early and then we'll get into the sort of, I think what everybody is really anxious for is what's gonna start actually at around 8 p.m. Um, but in the beginning, you're gonna hear a presentation by Judy Parrott from Barrett Planning Group, um, who's going to talk about sort of a little bit about the public planning process, um, what exactly a housing plan is and what it will do for the town of Arlington, and also summarize the engagement opportunities that we've created. Um, we will then go into the bigger presentation, which will get into issues around the housing affordability, um, understanding fair housing issues in Arlington, um, and introducing us to sort of the, the needs that we have in order to build capacity to create and preserve affordable housing in our community. Um, as many of you know, this is a, an updated five-year plan. We have a current housing production plan that was active in 2016. Um, and it expires uh, this year. And so we're looking forward to having a new housing plan that will guide us in the future. Um, and your input has been critical to that process. This is an iterative process. And so we're building out the parts to the plan. There is not a current housing draft plan that anybody has reviewed. That is in part what is happening this evening is sharing with you the research and information that's been taking place and giving you an understanding of that engagement process. Um, so with that, I think what we're gonna do next is I'm gonna turn this over to Judy Barrett from Barrett Planning Group, who is gonna introduce us a little bit further to um, what is the housing plan? What will it do for the town? A little bit more about the planning process and engagement. And then we'll move into the further, the deeper parts of the presentation this evening. Thank you everybody for your participation. If you've been participating all along, we appreciate it. If you're new to this, you'll learn a little bit more tonight, and there will be plenty of time for Q&A as we get along throughout the night. Judy? Oh, and actually, real quick, I'm going to jump in and do a quick overview. Okay, Kelly, sorry. Guidelines. That's all right. That's all right. So I'm Kelly Linema. I'm the Assistant Director of Planning and Community Development, and I've been working with the Housing Plan Implementation Committee on this plan for a while. Um, so just for tonight, um, just a few guidelines. I think everyone is fairly uh, familiar with this at this point, but just to be clear, um, everyone's muted by default. If we, um, if we are hearing a lot of background noise and we have to mute somebody um, just to kind of allow everyone to hear the presentation, please don't take it personally. Uh, we just wanna make sure that everyone has the opportunity to hear what's being said. And when we get to the, we're gonna have three sections of Q&A. So when we get to those sections, we're asking people to use the raise hand function. Um, and that way we'll be able to identify who has a question or a comment. If you're comfortable, um, turning on your camera is a great way to better connect with everyone. Uh, feel free to use the digital background if that helps you feel a little like your home is a little uh, kept private from the rest of the group. Um, but it is kind of nice to see everyone's faces just like we would in a, in a regular public meeting. Um, as I mentioned before, we do have three Q&A sessions planned for tonight. So again, we're asking people to use the raised hand feature to be called on, um, and then you can ask your question. I will also be paying attention to everyone's screens, which is another way it's nice if people can keep their cameras on. So if somebody is having a hard time or technical difficulty in getting that raised hand, um, finding that raised hand feature, I'll try to pay attention and make sure we give you an opportunity to ask your question. And then finally, uh, this meeting is being recorded and it will be posted to the town's, web, town's website in a few days. And then later on in the presentation, um, I know a number of people have asked about reviewing the draft plan and what comes next. And so we'll be sharing that before the close of the meeting tonight. Um, and just Zoom 101, once we get to the Q&A, the mute and unmute buttons are in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. Um, and the raise hand feature is kind of right in the middle of your screen. There's a little smiley face with a plus on it for reactions. And at the very bottom of that is the raised hand feature. 
And if you're calling in by the phone, star nine controls your mute and unmute and star six is to raise your hand. So you can go to the next slide. Um, Jenny provided a, a solid overview of what we're going to be discussing tonight. So at this point, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Judy Barrett from Barrett Planning Group to really get us started on discussing the project background and what we've done so far. Alexis, next slide. Thank you, Kelly. You're welcome. So we're gonna start by doing kind of a review for those of you, especially who have missed um, any of the previous meetings, a little bit of a, a background about the housing production plan and what it's comprised of um, and kind of the work that's gone on both in terms of the technical analysis as well as the, the outreach and community listening that's been done. Um, so we were asked by the town to prepare a housing production plan um, in accordance with DH Department of Housing and Community Development Guidelines. And among other things, that means that we have a plan um, that, will, that has three kind of basic components. And the heart of every housing plan is the needs assessment, where we look at um, you know, current demographics, um, you know, how has the community changed, kind of looking at where the community's been, where it is today, where it seems to be going in terms of household makeup, um, uh, race, income, uh, family size, a whole variety of things that relate to the kinds of housing that, uh, that a community has and may need um, and the extent to which the supply as it's evolving through ordinary operations of the market may or may not address the needs of all the types of households uh, that live in or want to live in your community. Um, the needs assessment also looks at uh, what are the development possibilities and constraints and how the constraints might be mitigated. And what that means is, you know, if you have um, a disconnect between the housing needs that exist and what is actually being produced uh, within the market, you try to understand why and what is it that makes it challenging for developers to build what appears to be needed um, and, and how might those things be addressed through some mechanism or another. And then we also look at just what's the infrastructure capacity of the town, the roads, the water and the sewer and so forth. You know, is there, are there utility or infrastructure constraints that would impede uh, the town's ability to provide uh, housing for a variety of households at a variety of income levels? Um, from that, we develop a set of goals and per DHCD's guidelines, there are two types of goals. Uh, one is sort of what kind of housing do you want to see if you're trying to address the needs that are identified in the needs assessment? Um, what's the sort of mix? What's it, what does it consist of? And then um, centrally, the sort of housing production goals. Now, bear in mind that under DHCD guidelines, a housing production plan has a five-year life and that the overriding purpose of the plan from DHCD's point of view is what is the town going to do to try to work toward the 10% minimum under chapter 40B, which means 10% of your housing stock uh, is affordable to lower moderate income households. So the numerical goal is tied to the sort of what can you do to keep working toward that 10% um, as you also then try to encourage a particular mix of housing that you'd like to see in your community or that you need. From that, we then develop um, implementation strategy. So if you understand the needs and you have goals, what are you going to do to try to address those goals? And those typically involve um, zoning or other types of policy changes that might help to better align what's being produced with what the needs are. Um, identifying particular sites or areas in the community that would make sense for um, a diversification of housing. Uh, and perhaps even higher density of housing than it exists today. Um, what kind of characteristics would you like to promote if you're going to be making regulatory reform changes in your community? Kind of how would you like to encourage not only supply, but a supply of a particular mix, which relates back to that mix of housing types goal that I referred to earlier. And then the other aspect of implementation uh, is typically thinking about where a town has opportunities to connect with its neighbors to perhaps 
uh, address regional need, uh, bearing in mind that ultimately the purpose of Chapter 40B is to address regional housing needs uh, and break down barriers that exist at municipal borders. So what opportunities are there for a town to pursue some kind of regional strategy and also to recognize a community's own contribution to what may be regional barriers? So those are the three key pieces of a housing production plan. Next slide, please. So we were asked to, you know, first and foremost, create a plan that would be approvable by DHCD so that um, we have the opportunity as a town to uh, potentially qualify for what's called safe harbor, which we'll talk about a bit more as we go on. But if the town is uh, creating additional lower moderate income units under an approved housing plan, the town gets to uh, request some credit for that, if you will, uh, that might make it a little bit easier for the Board of Appeals to manage the Chapter 40B comprehensive permit process. So that's one of the reasons to, uh, to seek DHCD approval of a housing plan. But more than that also is, you know, what's realistic in the market area that this community is located in? What would make sense? What will help to address unmet needs for affordable housing? Um, and what kinds of strategies will help to ensure that the housing that is produced is equitable across all income levels? Low or moderate um, people who are uh, whose incomes are higher than perhaps the income limits under the subsidized housing inventory, but whose needs are nonetheless not being met, again, by existing operations of the market. And then also to discourage concentrations of affordable housing in any one particular area or areas of town. So uh, equity and affordability uh, and choice are all very much knitted together in informing kind of the framework for this plan. Next slide, please. So we began with um, a, you know, sort of developing a community engagement plan for what, what we would do uh, and what your community would do to try to reach out and ensure that people with an interest in this topic would have access to developing the plan or contributing their ideas for inclusion in the plan. Um, we did a tour of the town. Um, so you know, those of us who had not worked in Arlington before had a chance to kind of get become familiar with the place um, for at least one of us on the team that was uh, you know, coming back again and seeing how things were going. Um, there were questionnaires available for people uh, through the town website to ask questions or offer comments. Um, we conducted interviews or you know, small group and individual interviews in a couple of blocks during this process. Uh, one being in May, it was a pretty intensive couple of days of almost nonstop interviews with different people. And then again in August, uh, there were some additional interviews that were conducted. Um, we offered a, a tool called a meeting in a box, sometimes called a kitchen conversation. Uh, it's basically a way to give a community a box full of materials that one would use for a meeting in their kitchen uh, or their backyard as the case may be for a cookout uh, with their friends and their neighbors to be able to kind of ask people questions very similar to the kinds of questions that we asked in the community meetings. And the advantage of a meeting in a box approach is that not everybody can sign on to a meeting at this hour of the evening. Um, it's even harder when they were all face to face, but um, some people are just more comfortable talking in smaller groups. Some people are a little more comfortable when they're in an affinity type group. So which we're trying to kind of broaden the opportunities for people to contribute their thoughts to this plan through a combination of interviews, um, uh, survey, you know, online forms, and then this meeting in a box process, which um, I believe there were a, a total of eight done, if I'm not mistaken. Kelly, I'm looking to you because I know you have all these numbers right, very clear in your head. We actually offered the meeting in a box uh, in a couple of intervals during the planning process. So those of you who may have participated or hosted one of those, um, we very much appreciate your effort. There were other community engagement efforts as well. Um, there were uh, staff, I think, reached out to the farmer's market a couple of times to try to talk to people who participate in that activity in the community. There was also an online mapping exercise where people could um, access a map of the town and identify locations that they thought might be appropriate for some type of uh, different type of housing, uh, dense or different type, you know, whatever, but just to be able to comment on potential locations that might make sense. 
Um, we had a couple of community forums along the way, uh, as would be expected. One was in June and the other was in September. Um, at the June meeting, we kind of explained in much more detail than I am now, what's a housing plan? What are we doing here? Um, tried to kind of present some high level findings at that point and get some input from folks about what we were seeing and maybe things that we had missed. Um, we met again in September to think about what the goals might be for the plan, as well as, uh, you know, here are some goals that we think might make sense, what kinds of strategies might help to achieve them. And in both of those sessions, we had kind of a large group presentation followed by some breakout session um, uh, interviews with, you know, smaller groups of people, which was very helpful to us. Um, the needs assessment, of course, is, as I said, it's a um, really very much uh, a rich collection of demographic and housing data, um, looking at market trends. We tapped kind of several different market sources to try to understand the market in your community. Uh, and then, you know, all of this kind of feeds into the goals and strategies, which really is the focus of what we want to present to you this evening. Next slide, please. So I think with that, I want to kind of get into a little bit of an overview of planning 101, if you will, uh, and then how this particular housing plan fits into the structure of, of really any kind of planning exercise. And so whenever we start working on, on, on a plan with a community, you know, the, one of the questions is just sort of what's the problem or what are the problems that you want this plan to, to address? And as we get into understanding those problems, we try to figure out with you uh, and on our own through research, sort of what are the underlying causes of the problem that we're being asked to try to speak to uh, and what have been the contributing factors. So some things are causal and some things are contributing and it's important to try to sort out what, what those are. What options do we think the community has to address the, the problem or the problems? Um, you know, what are kind of potential solutions, if you will? and which ones might be most effective. So there's usually a range of possibilities, but some things are probably going to be more effective than others. Um, and then when you sort of can figure out what solutions might make sense, well, then we have to ask, do you have the resources that you would need to do this? And if you don't, what resources would you need to actually have um, a more effective um, housing agenda in your, your community to address affordability and other needs? What's standing in the way, which gets to the heart of the barriers analysis, and what can be done to overcome those barriers? So that's really the architecture of, I think, any planning process. Um, and it very much informs kind of how this housing production plan is, is organized. Next slide, please. So looking at the goals and the strategies, uh, which is really what we're going to focus on tonight, I think the, the problem identification phase of the process is really sort of determined through the needs assessment. And what we saw there are really kind of, I think, three key things. There's a shortage of affordable housing. Um, there are impediments to housing choice and fair housing, and there are capacity limits in the town that, um, that probably need to be addressed as well. And you'll find very shortly that we've sort of organized the goals for the plan around those three key topics, where there's an inadequate supply of affordable housing. There are impediments to housing choice, which is another way of saying there are fair housing issues that Arlington needs to address. And then there are uh, capacity issues that also need to be looked at largely in the realm of leadership for affordable housing. Um, the response to the problem is kind of, well, what are the goals for this plan? And, those should I, respond to the identified problems, which we, we think they do, and how do they align with DHCD's criteria? Because again, bearing in mind that what the town has asked us to do is to prepare a plan that DHCD will accept and approve. Uh, and the strategies finally are designed to address those goals and also be in alignment with DHCD's criteria. DHCD has some fairly prescriptive uh, review standards for a housing production plan. So we have to make sure as we're identifying things the town can do that at least some of them will address the DHCD requirements for, for review. And we've tried to kind of stay within that framework. Next slide, please. So looking, I guess, really at this first set of problems, um, you know, what we found 
and then the underlying issues are there's a shortage of safe and decent and affordable homes in Arlington, especially for low and very low income renters. I think that is really kind of an overwhelming uh, need that comes through in just about all of the data. And, um, it's not the only group that has needs, but it's a very obvious uh, deficiency in the supply of housing in the town. And I'm talking not only about affordable, but affordable that is safe and decent um, and priced to be affordable to people who are in the very low income levels. Uh, the town has very few options for first time home buyers as well to find a home that they can afford to buy. So uh, you can kind of see as the home prices in Arlington have accelerated, you can kind of understand why then therefore the town's um, household incomes are rising tremendously as a result because people, the, the, house, the cost of the housing in Arlington is a barrier for many people to choose to live in the town. Many older adult households in Arlington are housing costs burdened. What that means is that relative to their income, um, you have a lot of older adults who are living in housing and spending more than 30% of their gross monthly income on their housing costs. Um, and you can kind of see this fairly acutely among many of the senior households in your community. And the other thing too that we found is that the town doesn't really have today the regulatory or financial tools needed to reverse those conditions. Next slide, please. As a result of those kind of overarching findings from the plan, um, a set of goals emerged. One of which is uh, to increase rental and ownership housing for extremely low to middle income households. Um, it's kind of a broad brush here, but the supply in really all of those ranges is constrained uh, in some cases severely. Um, to create and maintain and preserve permanent housing for people with disabilities. Um, what we found is that there really is a very limited inventory of disability housing in Arlington, and it's something that the town uh, would need to work on as well. Uh, that is both a supply issue and also a fair housing issue, but uh, I just chose to park it in this group uh, for purposes of this presentation. And then preserving and improving the town's existing supply of affordable homes to provide healthy, safe, and stable living in part environments. So those are the kind of the three key affordability goals that we addressed uh, in the plan. Next slide, Alexis. There are a number of strategies in the plan that address this, these particular goals. Um, one, of course, is you have a you know, newly formed, to, soon to be activated affordable housing trust, which can be a really important asset for the town in addressing this plan uh, and meeting its affordable housing needs. One of the things that a housing trust can do is to provide enhanced home buyer assistance. So a very commonly used and very effective program for first time home buyers is from the Mass Housing Partnership One Mortgage Program, which essentially offers a reduced, very low interest rate mortgage for, um, for first time home buyers uh, and some others. But in some communities, uh, the, the city or town also puts money into the One Mortgage Program uh, to, to further write down the interest rate on the loan uh, or to hold some of the purchase price back and what's uh, sometimes commonly known as a second mortgage that is just there. It's not having to be repaid on a direct basis like a regular mortgage. What that does is it increases the buying power of the, um, of the home buyer. So that is a fairly common strategy out there for providing moderate income um, uh, first time home buyer opportunities. And that's something the housing trust could do. Uh, another thing a housing trust can do is to provide uh, low or no interest loans to, per, to, to write down the purchase price of affordable rental units. So if you have a rental development coming into your community where the rental units are priced for say 80% of median income, which is for many of you probably know this already, but that is generally the upper limit, uh, in upper income limit for subsidized housing inventory units. Well, you can use uh, affordable housing trust resources to buy those down to say 50% of area median income. And the advantage of course, is that when you're already, when you're trying to buy down a rent from 80%, it's much easier than buying it down from market. 
So that is something that is available. We do have some housing trusts in Massachusetts that have done just that. Um, the housing authority um, also could be making use of housing choice vouchers for home ownership. Uh, that is another strategy that's available in the community or it could be available in the community to do to encourage home ownership uh, housing. Um, providing capital grants to the housing authority. We know this is kind of already in discussion and part of the town's plans for using Recovery Act funds um, when you think that's great. But of course, you also have Community Preservation Act funds. DHCD has a preservation and modernization program. There are resources out there that the housing authority could take advantage of. They're going to have to ask for them, but I mean, that is certainly a possibility as well. The town currently has uh, provisions for short-term rental tax, meaning a tax that's paid for so-called Airbnb units. And we were just trying to make the point that although that's not a huge money generator, the town does have the ability to just put that revenue right into the hands of the housing trust. And that's probably an important thing to do because I can tell you housing trusts are really most effective if they have financial resources to work with. Next slide, please. CPA funds can be used to acquire and support development of group homes for people with disabilities. This has been done in several towns and I just wanna put in a plug for this. Um, every unit or every, every, uh, every unit for a person in a group home counts as a unit on the subsidized housing inventory. So if you have a, a single family dwelling, a large one that is renovated for a group home for say six occupants, that building counts as six units on the subsidized housing inventory, not one. So there are some um, SHI advantages, if you will, to doing this, but really it's about need. So that is something that you could embark on that often is, is, is received fairly well in neighborhoods because you're not really creating a very large structure. Often it's simply acquiring an existing one, perhaps doing a modest uh, addition to it but using it for a very legitimate and serious housing need that's hard to address. Um, providing architectural barrier removal grants for property owners to address disability problem, disability access problems. Um, people who have a family member with um, a mobility or self-care impairment being able to do ramps, to do um, lifts, to do, you know, to make sure that there's a clear path of travel to the home those things all really matter as part of a disability housing strategy. And those are other things that, that the town could do. Um, there are regional organizations that also provide housing for people in recovery. Uh, CASCAP is a, a good example. They have a number of homes in your region that are designed for people in recovery. And as you, you probably know this already, but people who are in recovery from substance abuse um, are, are, are fall within the definition of disability. So all of our communities, I think, I've never worked in a community where people didn't know someone who had died of, um, of an overdose. So thinking about how do you provide care in your own community for people who are trying to recover from substance abuse is an important aspect of meeting housing needs. Um, some communities have used their own general obligation bond authority to provide funding for affordable housing. Um, Nantucket comes to mind. It's probably the best example I can think of. It's not the only one, but um, they've just decided to literally put their money where their mouth is, and they are investing heavily in the acquisition of property for development of two to four to six unit buildings, um, some projects up as large as 30 units. Um, but they're doing that with their own, their own revenue. Um, so that's another possibility. And then providing financial support for multifamily development. I think we, we just think that's a terribly important thing. If you're trying to deal with a shortage of supply, you kind of have to be efficient about it. The housing trust could have a set aside of funding to uh, provide uh, resources for our lower moderate income rental development. And that would be an important thing for them to do as well. Address, again, to address needs identified in the plan. Next slide, please. So as I think we alluded to earlier, um, we, we are taking like little breaks here for a few questions here and there. Uh, we can do that now and we'll take some um, for a few minutes. We'll then go on to the next section and take some questions. And then, you know, at the end, if anybody's got questions we haven't gotten to in these few kind of intervening moments, uh, we can pick those up at the end. So 
uh, we'd be happy to take any questions from people. I'm not sure. Yeah, I see that um, Don Seltzer has his hand raised. Great. Uh, thank you. Um, I just think it would be equally useful if you could define in dollar terms what is meant by moderate income, low income, and very low income, just so that we're um, using a common point of reference here. Sure. Um, I'm going to give you general numbers, Don. Um, if you think okay. of a moderate income household at 80% of median. Uh, no, no, I was trying to get away from talking oh, about percent of AMI, just oh. a, a dollar figure. Oh, for income, you mean? Yeah. Well, it's going to range between, you know, probably 30 or 40,000 and 110. There's a wide range of need. So when, you, when you're talking about moderate income households, mm -hmm. you're talking about $110,000 uh, household income? 9210. 9, okay, and low income you'll consider to be what? Uh, 60 to 80 maybe. And then low income would be low, low, less than 60 then. Yep. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, I see um, Calpurnia has her hand raised. Okay. Hello? Hi, Calpurnia, Hi. go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, I was just curious, when you say that um, you see that seniors are house burdened, what are the implications of that? I'm just curious. Is it that they're destitute and house burdened or is that they're tapping to the equity of their homes to survive? Do you have any ideas of what that may mean? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's a little hard to get at because the way the Census Bureau reports housing cost burden, um, you can look at, you can kind of get your arms wrapped around tables that look at households with a current mortgage and those which don't. Um, it's about the closest you can get. There is also there are also a couple of tables that try to break down housing cost burden by age. Um, I think it's probably a mix of people who uh, are probably continuing to live in homes that may they may have a fairly significant amount of equity in, um, but but they but they just don't have a high enough income to support the house. There are other people who are. Um, who are not in that situation, who don't have equity to, to take advantage of. It's both, I think. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I'm just scanning down here to see if anyone else. Yeah, I think um, you can probably see it better than I can. <laughs> yeah, I don't see anyone else um, with hands raised or kind of waving. So, can give people one more minute. I think we could move on to the next section. Okay. Alexis, can you switch to the next slide? So the second grouping of goals and strategies uh, revolves around fair housing. And some of the problems that we looked at uh, include the existing inventory of affordable housing in Arlington tends to be concentrated in areas that were once described a very long time ago as definitely declining. Um, areas that are near the Arlington's borders with Somerville, Medford, and Lexington, and along Mass Avenue. Um, and what that's referring to is the way that properties were classified um, when the um, homeowners loan uh, corporation, uh, mortgage loan corporation was active in the 30s and 40s and trying to, frankly, uh, deal with the massive foreclosure crisis that you know was taking place in that period during the depression. So um, you're probably all familiar with this, but for those who are not, um, the uh, Hulk program largely relied on local sources to identify areas in each community where where the mortgage risk was very low. Mortgage risk is low because property values are relatively high, predominantly white population. 
um, uh, predominantly single family homes. Whereas other places perhaps were not quite so uh, highly, uh, or they were seen as higher mortgage risk, if you will, higher, higher uh, lenders risk because they were more multifamily or the housing units were older or uh, people of different races or different ethnic backgrounds or different ancestries were living in a particular area, were tended to be concentrated in a particular area. So Arlington kind of had this pattern of de definitely declining areas and we can still continue today to see traces of how that kind of, why all of that sort of happened. And fortunately or unfortunately, you can kind of also see uh, that pattern reinforced, um, perhaps not, in, not intentionally, but nonetheless reinforced uh, in much of the town's uh, existing zoning. Uh, the other thing that your zoning does is it pretty much freezes in place uh, the inequitable residential land use pattern that existed um, so many years ago. And I'll, I'll just share with you, I don't think this problem is unique to Arlington. I've worked in some other close in suburbs around Boston where uh, in the early 70s, um, communities, early 70s to mid 1975, which was the last time the State Zoning Act went through any kind of major reform, a lot of zoning was kind of rewritten in that period. And what tended to happen was that people who were worried about change and worried about kind of loss of character and loss of fabric essentially put zoning in place that froze what was there at the time. And, and so when you have that, and the economics kind of don't support that sort of pattern anymore, uh, it just becomes a real problem in terms of trying to respond to market opportunity and frankly provide for a variety of needs and interests um, in housing. So, so those are kind of problems that impede the, the, the provision of housing choice um, in Arlington. Next slide, please. Um, one of the ways that we sort of see the reinforcement of that old pattern is just where the subsidized housing is. So this map just sort of shows you where your existing chapter 40 V subsidized housing tends to concentrate. Um, and I don't think this is any big surprise to anybody, but again, it just sort of relates to where were those areas that were considered to be declining and where are the areas today where, um, you know, for the most part, it's a pretty much single family uh, zoning scheme where you really don't have much affordable housing. Um, there's a concentration here. And so from a fair housing perspective, we would want to try to think about strategies to not, not further that, um, that perhaps there are development opportunities in these corridors, which you would want to pursue, but not base your entire housing production plan on just that. How do you then think about equity uh, in the distribution geographic distribution of affordable housing. Next slide, please. So these are just maps that um, show kind of where your existing zoning districts are. And if you look at the map that is, um, you know, up that first that, that map that's most on the um, upper left, you know, those are really your single family districts. Um, and so you know, those are not really the areas where you tended to see a lot of the subsidized housing. And those are definitely not the areas that were once considered to be in decline. Um, when you get to the maps on the lower band on this slide, what you can begin to see is that the availability of any kind of mixed housing lies in areas that are fragmented. Um, there would be difficult properties to uh, to try to assemble anything and create a, a good development site. And that's kind of contributing to what I mean about things kind of being frozen in place. Um, so when you look at the regulatory scheme, the, um, the distribution of affordable, the existing affordable housing, you, you kind of can begin to see that there's this real difficult way to try to overcome these barriers and to overcome the concentration of lower, lower income, you know, lower income, or a lower value housing stock uh, in the community. So that's a concern um, because part of what you wanna do in any affordable housing plan is think about choice. Next slide, please. Um, you know, the, we've seen some elements in our work in Arlington of, uh, or some, some real voices of support for 
for fair housing and for equity, I don't know that the ideas are broadly recognized or understood. It's been hard to see that in our work with the town. Um, another thing that I think just people probably would benefit from understanding is it certainly informs our work is that housing insecurity, which is like the not really being able to, to rely on having safe, decent and affordable housing, um, it's not evenly distributed across the population. It, it disproportionately affects people of color, older people and people living on low or very low incomes. Um, in your own Fair Housing Action Plan, um, just it, the authors note that disability status was one of the most commonly reported bases for discrimination uh, of housing discrimination complaints, 11 out of 24 involved uh, disability. So when we think about why would be, why would disability housing be such an important part of increasing your supply? It's because that's part of the problem. Um, and, and that is a population that frankly struggles to find good housing choices uh, in many, in all communities that I've worked in. Um, so Arlington is no exception, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't do something about it. You really definitely should. Um, high quality, stable housing, it's kind of central to the health and well being of families with children. Um, fosters relationships and opportunities, limits chronic stress and reduces food insecurity. And by that we mean when people actually have housing they can afford that's good quality, then other aspects of their life are kind of on an even keel. And when that's not the case, uh, it becomes very difficult for people to, um, you know, they start making very difficult choices that tend to mean I'll stay in my house no matter what, but other things are going to give, medical care, food, food security, and so forth. Next slide, please. Um, we put these uh, images in just to kind of draw some content from the plan to present in this presentation, uh, just to sort of show what the income distribution is. The boundaries on the map in the upper left are based on what's called census blocks. They're sort of small areas defined by the Census Bureau. So uh, if it's any help to you, you can probably in, uh, see intuitively that the darker the area, the higher the income of the household. Um, there are some areas where the Census Bureau doesn't report a median because there's insufficient data. So those lightest areas are kind of a not, not really, um, you know, not reported. But for the most part, you can see, just as the subsidized housing distribution tends to be concentrated, that the areas with the lower income um, families and individuals in your community also tend to be concentrated as well. They're not broadly distributed. Um, there's certainly a big income gap between um, your households based on race. Um, especially for black households living in Arlington and also households that self-report as other race, um, which may be, you know, uh, it's just what people declare. So they're not they're necessarily declaring that they're black or Asian. They might be, you know, Native American or something else, but there are small numbers of households for, for whom uh, they're very low incomes living in your community, extremely low incomes, I would say. And then the other slide, the other chart at the lower right is uh, is simply, well, what does median household look like, income, excuse me, look like relative to age? And you can kind of see in that last that last band why older adult households might be feeling the pinch, and many of them reporting housing cost burden. Um, households under twenty five also have very low incomes. Um, your highest out incomes, not surprisingly, tend to fall in those kind of child rearing years where the households tend to have two wage earners. And it just, those are, that's really where your family households are. So you have two ends of the spectrum here where, um, where people are struggling based on age. Next slide, please. Housing prices are out of sync with the wage levels paid by local employers, including the town, by the way. So housing prices are, are not only just generally getting more unaffordable, but even people who work in the community would have trouble finding housing that they can afford. Um, the housing prices that may have been affordable once to families with modest incomes 
those prices have just gone out of sight. They're just, uh, it's just what's happened with your market, even since I was there working on the master plan a few years ago. Uh, it's pretty significant to see how housing prices have changed in Arlington in a fairly short period of time. Obviously, as your housing, as your house, households become more affluent, housing choice declines um, because it's really the strength of, of the, the higher income market that's driving what's being built. Um, Arlington has not used tools like Chapter 40R um, to create affordable housing and has opposed Chapter 40B development that could increase supply and choice. So I'm very aware that not every community I work in loves chapter 40B, I can accept that. But there are other tools available to Arlington that seem to not have been used that really could be important tools to address the lack of choice and certainly the lack of supply. Next slide, please. So we have a number of suggestions for strategies in the plan to address fair housing issues. One is providing equitable access to affordable home ownership and rental homes suitable for a wide variety of households, including both seniors and families with children. We see these, these needs in the needs assessment. Um, integrating affordable homes in all neighborhoods through reuse of existing structures, redevelopment of underutilized properties, especially if they're within walking distance of schools or parks and other kinds of amenities. Um, it's really important to review your zoning and other housing policies to encourage development that increases affordability. Improving development opportunities along major corridors to include a greater mix of housing options. And making equitable access to share green spaces and a healthy living environment a priority for the siting of affordable housing. Uh, and also, of course, for the siting of any future park or recreation facilities that the town may decide to uh, create. Next slide, please. Conduct a racial impact study and evaluate whether your current rules disproportionately affect black people and other people of color. I think every town needs to be doing this. When you look at your zoning policies, it's, it's not enough to just say, well, that's what we like. It's who is who benefits and who's harmed. Um, it would be good, I think, for the town, I think you may already be working on this, to kind of expand the data that are available about your subsidized housing units so that you know a little more about what's in that inventory. It's not just the number of units, but also how big are the units and how many bedrooms are there and how many actually are accessible to people with disabilities. Understanding how much of your housing supply may already have age restrictions associated with it. Um, and understanding just kind of the condition of the units that do exist. I mean, we certainly heard uh, plenty of comments about some housing condition problems in Arlington, and it would be good to kind of put a little bit more detail on that uh, in the databases that you have. The town could easily make two family dwellings and allowed use in all residential neighborhoods. I'm surprised, I was a little bit surprised not to see that in, in the zoning, but that would be a fairly simple thing um, to do that would increase supply in a way that's not incompatible with single family neighborhoods. Changing the zoning map to consolidate some districts and create realistic options for parcel assembly, hearkening back to the maps I showed you earlier, where you have a multifamily district to be sure, but the parcels, it, it, it's also fragmented that there's really no meaningful opportunity to find a development site or create one. And also thinking about designating some areas for so-called missing middle housing interspersed with commercial centers. Missing middle is this idea that, that somewhere between single family homes and gigantic apartment buildings, we have this, this continuum of different types of structures and uh, with different numbers of units, four, six, eight, um, you know, 20 unit buildings, but just a range of things so that there's more choice. Next slide, please. Removing regulatory barriers to multifamily development we think is going to be critical for Arlington to address the housing needs that it has. Um, developing zoning for multifamily housing near the existing and planned T stations. Um, you're probably going to hear more about that as the states, uh, as regulations and guidelines for the state's so-called housing choice bill evolve. 
uh, over the coming months. Uh, the town could adopt a 100% affordable housing overlay. I mean, we heard a lot of people talk about why one of the things they didn't like about existing um, 40B development is that we get some affordable units and then a lot of market rate units. Well, you could encourage 100% affordable units in your town, just as Cambridge is doing. Um, just thinking about where where would it make sense to to do that? Maybe in some of the desert, some some streets in your existing lower density neighborhoods and in nodes along Mass Ave and Broadway, where again there are, you know it makes sense to think about your corridors, but not limiting everything there. How can you get into the neighborhoods with more choice? So you could do an overlay. Now, as you may or may not know, an overlay district doesn't impose a requirement on developers to create 100% affordable units. But if they wanna take advantage of the density and height relief and the other things that come with it, then they have to build 100% affordable housing. So if you really wanna get that, make it possible for developers to do it on an as of right basis with very clear rules. Um, partnering with nonprofit and faith-based and for-profit developers to put eligible developments in the affordable housing overlay. Um, you know, commun more communities are looking at what the Cambridge ex um, experiment now and thinking about how they can apply it in their town. So you wouldn't be alone and looking for opportunities to do that. Establishing a reserve account for the housing trust to acquire existing single family homes and redevelop them as two family dwellings with an affordable unit. I mean, that would be a great way to think about opening up some of the land in those lower density zones to, to not fundamentally change the character of the neighborhood. A two family home is, is not certainly an affront to a single family dwelling. Um, but if you're going to try to preserve some of your existing supply, why not think about perhaps allowing some additions that would create an affordable unit uh, instead of ending up with an outright tear down on a very large uh, expensive home in its place. Next slide, please. Preserving existing parks and conservation land throughout town, especially in areas where there are existing concentrations of low income or minority neighborhoods and ensuring long-term access to public recreation. Where you have limited opportunities for green space on site, think about things like requiring newer, better sidewalks or bike paths or trails to access the nearest park or open space. You know, how can you make up perhaps for proximity with making it easy for people to get to the open spaces and parks that are available to them? Um, audit your current parking requirements and parking design standards. It's one of the most important things you can do to liberate sites from being undevelopable or unusable for uh, increasing supply. And then increasing use of green infrastructure to minimize stormwater runoff and reduce flooding and heat island effect. Um, I had some experiences about a year and a half ago in a community that had seen a lot of mixed use redevelopment um, in and around their town center. And I was interviewing town staff about how they saw the impact of those projects. And it was the conservation administrator who spoke up and said, I love them because they helped to remedy stormwater problems that have existed forever. So when somebody takes this, an older site and redevelops it, there's actually an opportunity to improve the environmental conditions associated with, with that property. It's something to think about. Next slide, please. That's a lot on fair housing. So again, I think we'll stop for a few minutes and ask if people have any questions about the goals or the strategies associated with them. Just looking here to see if anyone has their hand raised. If anyone has any questions, um, please feel to, uh, please use the raise hand feature. Um, I see Judith Garber. Hi, I just was wondering if you could clarify what you meant about um, the changing zoning districts so that you can um, have parcels or something like that. Uh, when you have a district that's only one small parcel, you don't have a good development site for redevelopment. So um, there was actually a reference to this even back in the master plan about looking at the configuration of those existing districts along Mass Ave and, um, and Broadway and thinking about how you might be able to create 
through simply changing the district boundaries, um, perhaps merging some properties into a single zone um, for multifamily development or mixed use so that you end up with better development sites. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Um, I saw Marianne, you had your hand raised. Did you have a question? Yeah, hi. Um, hi. Thanks, Kelly. Um, actually, so I had changed my mind because I wasn't sure I was completely clear. Um, so when I was looking at the map and I saw um, discussion or I, I saw the areas where there is already subsidized housing, a lot of it is the Arlington Housing Authority sites. Um, but then I saw also uh, the graph showing um, the need for um, older folks, for seniors to have housing. Um, I'm wondering if part of what is being said in the presentation is um, because we want people to have choice, um, if there is actually space and land that is available in the Arlington Housing Authority, um, specifically something at Drake Village, for example, um, is it still kind of looked at like, mm, we wouldn't want to put anything there because we want to disperse it more throughout town? I don't know if that makes sense. I hope that does. Oh, I think it's a, fair, it's a fair question and it does make sense. I think what you're going to hear from us is that there isn't one strategy. What we would not encourage you to do is think about just focusing your efforts on developing additional housing on, a, on an existing housing authority site. There may be opportunities. Some other towns have done that. They've done that with mixed income development. Um, uh, one of the towns I work in I got special permission from DHCD to make some land available on an existing public housing site to do a home ownership development. So, you know, there are opportunities to, to pursue, but I wouldn't put all your eggs in that basket because then what you really don't create is equitable choice. That's why there's a lot of different strategies being discussed here because I don't think one is gonna do it for you. All right, um, next we have Patricia. Thank you. Um, thank you, Kelly. I'd like to um, have my husband speak first. He well, is registered, but we're both using the same computer, unfortunately. So I will put him on. Um, thank you. Um, uh, thank you. We're playing a little bit of musical chairs here. Um, <clears throat> she had the more comfortable one, but now I've got it. Uh, uh, John Worden, uh, uh, Jason Street, um, uh, town meeting member from Precinct 8, and former moderator. Um, uh, yeah, a couple points that I should like to raise uh, about the previous um, uh, presentation. One, you talk about the 10% goal. You know, uh, you must be aware, I, I hope, that there's an alternative goal, which is 1.5% of land area. And we, we have uh, actually met that with the 40 Bs, if you include the 40 Bs now pending, which are about to get their uh, permits. Um, so that, that and, and, and I bring this up because uh, Arlington is already the, the 12th densest community in the whole state. We are the second densest town in the state. Um, and if, if other communities would do uh, strive for even half the density that we have already provided in, to provide housing, uh, we won't have the so-called housing crisis. So I think you really talk about regional solutions. Uh, let's, let's look at uh, some of our neighbors. Even Medford has a lower density than Arlington does. Uh, look, let's look at Lexington, Winchester, Belmont. Um, uh, they all have much lower densities. And uh, let, let, I think they, 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 they could do more to provide for these housing needs. Now, we talk about affordable housing, and that's uh, something that, that we've been very concerned about for a long time. Uh, and you mentioned uh, doing uh, uh, basically uh, turning single family houses into two family houses and allowing that throughout the town. Actually, we did that at the last town meeting uh, because the, the so called ADU article 
uh, allows anybody in any zone uh, to turn their house, to, to, to add their housing, add to their housing unit, a second unit. Uh, and there, there are practically no regulations, no permits, no nothing. Uh, and we, we asked in town meeting, uh, recognizing that maybe some, <clears throat> some good could come out of this otherwise dumb idea, uh, make those, make those, uh, those ADU units affordable. Uh, that that would uh, go a long way to solving the, this affordable uh, problem, but but that was opposed uh, by the town officials and by a majority of town meeting members. So, it's kind of some people speak out of both sides of their mouth. Um, I, I would like to um, also point out that um, um, the the another th uh, another initiative that that we've tried to impose, but can't get official support is there are a lot of small houses in, in Arlington. Some of them are small uh, capes that were built uh, starting going way back into the 19th century up, up until uh, uh, the, the uh, post-war period, early part of the post-war period. And um, by the war, I mean World War II, by the way, that isn't clear to you younger folks. Um, and, and a lot of um, uh, so, uh, sort of ranch houses, uh, one, one level, one and a half level, um, houses uh, uh, built uh, in the uh, post-war period in the 50s and 60s. And um, those houses, although they're a lot more, they cost a lot more than they used to, uh, those are relatively, in a relative scale, those are affordable. And, and we, we have urged that uh, steps be taken through zoning uh, to protect those houses from uh, being torn down and replaced by these, uh, these mega mansions that that uh, the developers love and, and, and the rich, rich people from wherever uh, uh, seem to want, to want to buy in Arlington, thus forcing up the prices. But again, we've not been able to get uh, support from, 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 from the town administration uh, to, to do something about this. And there was an article to a temporary moratorium uh, for a couple of years to, to, to study the problem. No go. Uh, so th th there are initiatives that have been proposed uh, to deal with the affordable housing uh, uh, situation, but you've got to get everybody on board and to not just say, well, the, 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 the solution is 40 Bs all over the place. No, that's not a good solution. Uh, and, and the one final thing I should like to mention, that a lot of pe uh, older people uh, are being forced out of town uh, because the taxes are so high. And something that you have to crank into your computations, which I heard, heard no mention of, is Every person who moves into town, additional person who moves into town, costs twice, about twice as much in, in services uh, as, uh, as, 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 the, as the taxes on their, their house or, or residence provides. So those are some factors in Arlington. They may not be unique to Arlington, but they're very particularly here. Those are some things that you need to address if we really want to uh, find some solutions to this problem. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, I think just to summarize what I heard and Judy, um, I don't know if um, there's anything you wanna to respond to here, but um, questions about the 1.5% general land area minimum, um, ADUs, um, impacts of a moratorium and um, taxes as an impact, as an influential factor for particularly senior citizens. Thank you. Um, Kelly, I would like to make a Patricia, comment. can you hold on just a second? Because I okay. think we wanted right. to right. give um, the consultants a chance to respond. Thank you. So I don't think I'll try to respond to all of that, but I just do want to point out um, if the town reaches the 1.5% general land area minimum, you don't need the housing production plan anyway. Okay. So um, I think that's all I would have to say about that. Okay, thank you. Um, Patricia and then Jean, and then um, we probably want to go on to the next section. Yeah, oh, thank you, Kelly. I um, just want to make a point that, uh, maybe as a question, um, that um, in your map where you show this, the subsidized housing units where they are distributed in town, um, you know, that, that of course looks 
rather yoked out around the central pathway. However, um, you you must remember that that does not account for the, the section eight subsidized units, which are an excellent scattered site solution that is not recognized by uh, official 40B um, documents in any way, but it is, sub it is subsidized by the taxpayers. And we have quite a number of them in Arlington that shouldn't be just ignored. Um, and they are all over the place. They're not just in those um, more dense areas. Um, th there are some right here in Jason Street. I have friends that I visit who are in Section 8 units in this area. So that is that really we're now getting a, a complete picture of how we take care of the needs of affordable affordability here in Arlington. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Um, Jean? Uh, yes, thanks. And um, thank you, Judy, for all of this interesting um, and thought-provoking information. I have a few questions. I'll, I'll do them um, one at a time. Um, I wonder if you took a look at the lot sizes in our R0 and R1 zones and whether we should take a look at reducing the sizes. The, realize, the reason I ask is because the lot sizes are greater than you'd have in smart growth zoning districts for R0, R1, and R2. So I wondered if you had taken a look at that and if you had, if you would comment on that. No, I didn't look at, I mean, we look at the lot sizes, but I think that um, where we landed on it was that it would just make more sense to uh, allow two family dwellings than to, work, than to try to change the lot sizes because you still end up in a situation where you may not end up with an actual developable piece of land. Yeah, I mean, part of the reason I ask about that is because one of the things that's driving the cost of uh, housing here is the cost of land. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for most of us, um, and I'm in the R1 district, the assessed value of the land is about twice, I think, more or less, the assessed value of the house. So if you could build two houses on the property instead of one, you'd be splitting the land value mm -hmm. and therefore getting theoretically at least a reduction in cost or you could put you know, two, two families instead of one two family on the lot. So um, mm -hmm. I don't know, I just think you might wanna take another look at that and compare it to the state requirements for smart growth zoning districts okay. on lot sizes. Um, another question, uh, another question I have is how do towns balance commercial development versus residential development? Because, you know, what we hear a lot in town is not only do we need more affordable and more missing middle housing, we also need more commercial development and a greater commercial tax base. And in a sense, the housing competes with the commercial development um, for the developable parcels. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering how communities balance those. Not well. <laughs> That's probably a flip answer, but um, and I don't mean to be flip. It's a very serious question. Um, you know, I I think that you really have to kind of look at what's happening in the market, and do you have districts that may just be inappropriately zoned in the first place, or may or the zoning for them may be obsolete. Um, and and if it, if it really is obsolete, if it just isn't going to work for say industrial development or something, then you know it may make more sense fiscally um, as well as just um, you know taking advantage of land that's being underutilized to think about allowing some housing. Um, you know, a, a mixed use development bylaw that 
works can preserve ground floor commercial space and actually help to enhance it by virtue of people living in the district. Um, you know, I don't know that Arlington is all that well cited and si situated in terms of just the road network and so forth for a large amount of commercial development. I think it is a, it's a struggle for you guys, but I certainly would think the town would want to do what it can to, to make sure that you can support the commercial centers that you have. And housing is not a bad way to do that, to be honest with you. Um, but I think really, you probably are going to want to make sure that your mixed use zoning is actually going to work. And I'm not sure that the jury is still out on that. I don't know if Jeff or Nate on this call may have some other, our, our colleagues from Horsley Witten Group may want to even chime in on this. Well, no, I think you're right, uh, Judy. Um, this is Nate Kelly from Horsley Witten. Um, the, you know, it, the devil is in the details on mixed use zoning. Um, and to your, to your point, um, what we are seeing everywhere now is that, um, a residential component is really necessary to make a commercial component viable, uh, both in the you know in the life of the business, but even in the underwriting. The way the financial institutions are underwriting, um, they're they're not really willing to underwrite the commercial components in a lot of cases in any robust manner. But they are the, the residential um, because they know that the market is so strong and commercial markets are not strong at all they were weak in many cases before covid and now in many cases they're weaker um, so residential um, developments um, which is often in a mixed use and and multifamily setting is tax positive by the way um, yeah. is uh, is really a smart fiscal uh, decision in the end for the community yeah i mean thanks for that help i mean i think one of I mean, I, I think we're seeing that in the mixed use developments in town that, you know, we've been told, at least in some instances, that the residential component really carries the commercial piece. And the other point that I think it's important that you made is that not every new residence in town costs the town in terms of taxes. Mm -hmm. You know, most of the development we've had in town in the past few years has been tax positive for the town, not tax negative. I, I did have one other question. It's about the affordable housing overlay. Uh, some of us attended uh, a Zoom a few weeks ago with some affordable housing developers and um, who are building 100% affordable housing. And every one of them, um, said that the only way they were able to make it work was the city or town basically gave them the land for zero or almost nothing and that they wouldn't be able to financially make it work if they had to pay the cost of land so i mean can you comment on that in arlington and and how do we combine your suggestion for the affordable housing overlay with the high cost of land in town right now Oh, I think it's very difficult. I mean, I think that if you, um, you know, if your housing trust is able to be a real agent of development, then you may in fact be able to acquire some sites that you are selective for a reason and making those available uh, within the overlay may give you that ability to essentially write down the land cost and get some development. Um, you know, it all, it's, Developers want to do a what's going to make some money, but B is going to get an, a, a, an approval with the least amount of hassle. So if the economics work because the practically the dimensional regulations work and there's subsidy in the deal, which is the other part of it that I think is critical, then, you know, it, it becomes more possible to have a conversation about whether 100 percent is going to work. But I think it's it's going to be it's it's in land price. It's in what kind of housing is it and can you get other sources of subsidy so can, I, could, I just, it work, could it work better if you can't write down the cost of land at let's say a 50 percent affordability overlay zone yeah you could i mean you could certainly look at that sure, sure. Mm -hmm. okay um, thanks you want to make sure you're not inviting some unintended consequences right. 
But I, I mean, yes, I mean, you certainly could think, think of it in those terms. Okay, thank you so much. You Appreciate welcome. it. Thank you. Um, so I see we have three other people with their hands up. And I think what we want to do is, is um, go Joanne, Don, and then Neil. And then we do have this third section to present. So I think if we um, could start with Joanne, and then we'll uh, go to Don and then Neil. Thank you. Um, Joanne Preston. Um, I just want to caution people not to conflate creating housing with creating affordable housing. I live in the Webb Coward neighborhood, which is a zone to family. Um, we used to have um, many single family homes, but they have been bought up by developers for between $600,000, $800,000. Uh, they were in perfect condition and they were very interesting architecturally, by the way. Um, and they were torn down and uh, we call luxury duplex townhouses uh, replaced the single family house with two luxury uh, townhouses, uh, which sold for well over a million dollars each. So that is increasing housing. That is not increasing affordable housing. Often people look to Economics 101 or what they think is Economics 101 to say, the more housing you have, prices go down. But Arlington, that hasn't happened in Arlington, it's in a regional housing market. So more housing, in the case of our neighborhood, means more expensive housing. Um, I'm not sure how it's tax positive. Actually, uh, my single family house is pie shaped. So we have some land in the back. Uh, we pay taxes the same amount as the people in these luxury duplexes. And I know them, I like them. They all have um, two and more children who are going to public schools. Public schools are 40% I last saw of um, um, the town budget. So um, uh, I don't want to take up time with that now, but I'll talk to Jean about it sometime. But please, let's not think that changing one family zoning to two family is going to result in more affordable housing. It will result in luxury housing, not affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Um, Don? Uh, thank you. I'd like to go back to your introduction. I think you had listed as one of the priorities retaining what affordable housing we have in town. Um, and I thought, I would hope that would include our um, older, less expensive um, homes. Um, it's This is sort of a uh, touches on what Joanne was just talking about. Uh, one of my concerns is that we have several thousand of these houses in Arlington, and as they come on the market, uh, normally they would be affordable to moderate incomes, um, but a good proportion of them when they hit the market are being bought up and redeveloped at basically twice the selling price of what the, the builders are buying them for. And I mean, this is just normal market for, uh, forces. It's hard to control, but do you have any solution to this as far as trying to retain this type of housing stock? Um, Judy? Sorry, you're on mute. Um, your town and every town, I think there are people who would like to preserve that housing stock. Um, first of all, I have to tell you, I think that trying to preserve an existing dwelling unit is the most expensive way to try to create affordable housing because you are competing with what's going on in the market. So what we, where we landed with this was instead of just replacing an existing older home 
with a very large expensive single family home that perhaps some targeted acquisition of older homes that could be with an, with an addition turned into a two family dwelling with one affordable unit might be something to consider. Would that mean um, legislation or zoning laws that require that uh, the tear down and redevelopment of a single family into a two family would have to include at least one affordable unit? I don't think so. I don't think you can do that. Then uh, you would be offering an incentive case. to create. Well, I mean, it, it depends on your objectives. I mean, I no, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about creating an opportunity to create additional supply. Instead of losing an older home to a large single family home, perhaps thinking about ways that you create something that's moderately affordable as a second dwelling unit. Um, it would be nice for that to happen, but uh, what we're seeing is um, a single family home that is in an R2, as Joanne said, is it's being up, bought up for seven, eight hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars and being torn down and converted into duplex condos right. that go for nine hundred and fifty thousand and higher each. Mm -hmm. That's not that's going in the wrong direction. Thank you. Um, Neil? Yes, uh, thank you, Kelly. Um, let's see, I think it's, I, I, just want to, I, I just wanted to say, I think it's really important in these discussions for the presenters and everybody to be as honest as possible <clears throat> and to be, to not um, either, you know, kind of hide information or not, to, or, or shade information, because housing issues, I think, are so comp complicated ranging from policy to urban design to economics. And so um, I just think it's it's really important that we we all try to be honest with each other and straightforward. And um, I, along that, in that vein, just a, just a quick uh, correction. I think, Jean, you said that um, there, was, there was a forum a couple of weeks ago with <clears throat> some developers that have produced affordable housing um, several developers, and um, I was on that panel. I'm on the board of the Housing Corp of Arlington, and um, we've done, and we're just just about finished with a new development of 48 units of affordable housing. Um, but you said that all the developers had said that they could not have done the development without the town or city um, giving the property to the developers for free or providing it for free. And just to correct that, um, in Arlington, the Housing Corp of Arlington, uh, which we now are coming up on having 150 units of affordable housing, we've, as much as we'd like it, we've never had any property given to us for free. <clears throat> um, it's, it's um, in fact, we've, we have to pay and compete with the market, which is one of the many challenges of doing affordable housing in a town like Arlington. Arlington is expensive. It's just expensive. It's we're not going to change the fact that it's it's an expensive town relative to many many other towns, um, and so subsidy dollars and in order to do the development and subsidy dollars to pay for the land and subsidy dollars to help clean up the hazardous waste on sites that have to be cleaned up so that they can be used is the key, unless. Um, Somebody has some other idea. I just wanted to clarify that that um, we've never been given any property for free. Um, and I and just a, a quick question I wanted to ask um, uh, regarding the, the idea, which I think I'm I'm very much in favor of trying to convert uh, and purchase existing housing and uh, fix it up and preserve it as affordable rental housing. The Housing Corp of Arlington has uh, 14 two-family buildings that are affordable um, properties. And I think it's great that they integrate into the neighborhoods pretty well, very well, I would say. Um, but they are extremely expensive right. 
to manage from a property management point of view. So I, I wonder when, you know, it's one of your strategies that you listed, Judy, uh, is to be, to convert single families to two families, or I'm wondering what you're thinking in terms of property management of those and ownership of those, I guess. I think we were thinking of them as owner occupied with a rental unit. So with no, no actual income restrictions, no, in other words, they would be, you'd be, I guess, as some people say, they'd be, you know, um, affordable in the wild or wild affordable units. In other words, they're, they're native. They're not, there's no subsidy attached to them. Right. No, I mean, I no think, I guess. I'm sorry, Neil, I didn't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> right. No, no, I, I, I forgot to say that last word. So I had the, 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 the restrictions part of it is the, part that goes you know. yeah no i mean it's not the kind of strategy that's going to create the very low income housing that an organization like yours is so good at it's getting at this question of the tiers of affordability so you know the second unit in a two family dwelling uh, in in you know in a district that's otherwise single family you know is probably not going to be a subsidized housing inventory unit but it might reach the sort of, I mean, we all struggle with what to call these things, but the sort of over moderate income, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, a, a unit kind of restricted in that, that in some income range of, I hate to fall back on percentages again, but you know, 100 to 120% or something like that. I mean, that is not an unheard of program. You just don't have it in Arlington. And I certainly wouldn't put all the eggs in the basket of a program like that. We're just saying we've heard about people being concerned about losing existing single family homes to large big mansions. And all we're saying is you might be able to get some additional supply, albeit in a, um, you know, not SHI affordable context, but tiers of affordability that people have expressed concern about in a scattered site kind of way. That's really all that it's about. But I certainly respect what you're saying. It's, um, Thank you. you know, it's not a, it's not a strategy to create a lot of deeply affordable housing. It wouldn't. I, I see two more people have their hands raised. I really want to get to this third section of the presentation, yeah. and then we do have a another section of Q and A after that. So let's let's move on to that, and then I know Jean and Joanne, you do have your hands raised, so we'll, we'll get to you at the end. But um, we do want to go into this next section. Okay. So the last kind of grouping of the goals and strategies is around capacity. Um, Advocacy for housing seems to be fragmented and not very well organized. Um, it's been a pleasure to talk to people in Arlington who who are really you know true soldiers of affordable housing, but there aren't a lot of them. Um, there's a lot of misinformation about affordability and housing development, and you know developers in particular market what's happening with the market and also local government's responsibility for housing affordability and housing justice. There just seems to be an awful lot of misinformation. We've heard it pretty much from the beginning. There doesn't appear to be a consistent or generally understood or respected policy framework for increasing the supply of affordable housing. So that's kind of a problem statement that we saw with, uh, with capacity. Next slide, please. So there are some goals in the plan around increasing capacity to produce housing through leadership development, uh, advocacy, um, an increase in staffing and funding and relationships with nonprofit and for-profit developers. So there's a variety of ways that a town can increase its capacity to provide housing. Um, this is really about the town's capacity um, internally and in terms of the relationships that it has. Build awareness for affordable and fair housing needs within Arlington and the larger region and Arlington's role in addressing broader inequities, which really has to do with some communities in the region are shouldering uh, a regionally unfair share of the housing need burden. And what can Arlington do to contribute to perhaps improving, um, you know, its, its status as a provider uh, of affordable housing in the region. So those are sort of two goals in the plan. Um, next slide, please. So there are several strategies talked about in the plan to get at this. And one is building relationships and encouraging nonprofit housing organizations and CBCs to build in Arlington. In addition, of course, to
to the Affordable Housing Corporation. I just want to make it clear, we're not talking about displacing the AHC. We're saying it's kind of hard to do what, what is being done um, without kind of broadening the reach to perhaps some additional CDCs that do work in the suburban metro area um, and they have had some very successful relationships with towns. Thinking about establishing a community land trust to support the development of permanently affordable housing. Uh, a land trust, of course, owns the land, um, may create ownership housing, um, uh, owns the land as that housing continues to sell. So the, what's happening with the land market doesn't end up driving the cost of the housing as it's resold in the future. Working with the Community Economic Develop Development Assistance Corporation and LISC to identify potentially interested CDCs. Sometimes we work in towns that would like to form relationships with nonprofits, but don't know where to start. So those are two organizations that have active relationships with community development corporations and nonprofit housing developers, um, really all over Massachusetts. And tapping into that resource to find potential partners would be a good thing to do. Um, sponsoring roundtables for you know, the nonprofits, the CDCs, and for-profit developers and subsidizing agencies to provide public education about the cost of developing and managing affordable housing. You know, to Neil's comment about the expense of managing kind of scattered site, two family, it's true, it's very expensive way to proceed, but people don't always understand that. So these parties that are kind of really essential to production could, could help to increase the knowledge base uh, in your community and maybe try to even out some of the pretty significant misinformation that exists. Next slide, please. Um, support advocacy and tenant organizing efforts within the housing authorities, um, homes, and AHC and other affordable housing developments. Um, we, we had an interesting interview yesterday for a hot, another housing plan we're working on. And one of the interviewees um, made the point of talking about how there's a big difference between advocates and stakeholders. And it's just important to kind of recognize who you're talking to and what their interests are when you're trying to, to think about affordable housing. So organizing the real stakeholders uh, is, is probably gonna be an important thing for the town to think about. What can the town do to support that? Um, appointing affordable housing advocates to town boards and commissions is really kind of basic. Um, if you wanna be able to build advocacy capacity, you need to actually put it on your boards and, and committees. Um, scheduling periodic and predictable conversation meetings with the redevelopment board, the housing plan implementation committee, and you know, these other groups to set an annual housing implementation agenda consistent with this housing plan. You know, why is this in here? Because um, I think in many towns, at least where we've worked, we find um, that advocacy for affordable housing is either non-existent in government or it's very fragmented. And it's frankly not a very sexy place to be. If you wanna get involved in local government, most people aren't raising their hand and saying, I wanna be on your housing trust or your housing partnership. They wanna be on a select board. They wanna be on a school committee. They wanna be on a finance or advisory board. And they want these sort of jobs that have a lot of visibility. Housing, serving in housing ought to be just as attractive as that. And there are a lot of things that public officials in a town can do to send that message. That's not happening in Arlington today. Next slide, please. Encouraging and organizing people to speak at public hearings and meetings about the needs and benefits for affordable housing. It shouldn't just be people who are opposed, but people who are supportive um, it can be really scary, especially in a town where there's a lot of opposition to Chapter 40B and subsidized housing it can be really scary to supporters to get up at a public hearing and speak in favor of housing development. That only happens because there's an active effort underway to cultivate that group, those groups, and make sure that they have just as much space to speak at a public hearing as the people who are opposed. Um, Strengthening your education and about affordable housing and equity um, is very important. The, the image on this slide was something we did for another town where we basically took jobs that were in the existing employment base, looked at what they're making and created these sort of handouts on, this is what people who work in your town can actually afford. 
and they can't find housing in your community that would fit, you know, that would, that would meet their needs and yet they're serving you every day. So what does that say about the kind of community that you actually are? Engaging town officials to confront and address disinformation. Misinformation is just, I don't understand. Disinformation is I understand and I'm going to distort the message. And that needs to be addressed as well. Next slide, please. I think that may be it on the capacity issues and I'll take more questions at this point. Great, um, and just in the interest of time, I'm, I think what we want, what, I, what I'm recommending that we do is we um, have Jean and then Joanne, sorry if Joanne, you did have a question. And then I do wanna just share the next steps and that way yeah. if, any, if anybody else, if any other questions come up as part of this, then anybody who needs to go because we are 10 minutes over um, can go, but I do want people to understand what happens next. So Jean. Yeah, thanks. And I want to thank Neil for correcting me. I think all the other people on that panel said that the cost of the land was brought down, but not HCA. So thank you, Neil. Um, I did have one question for Judy, talking about the need for a community land trust in Arlington. Um, I'm a little also interested because I'm in, on a nonprofit board in a, a small city that's just created a community land trust. And I'm sort of wondering in Arlington, what's the purpose of the community land trust if we already have the housing corporation of Arlington? Where, well, what's its niche that HCA doesn't fail. Well, I think that, um, you know, some of the land trusts I'm familiar with focus on doing ownership housing. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you have the ability to control the price of the land, that has a big impact on being able to preserve the intended resale value of the units as they sell. Um, and I don't think, I, I want to make this really clear, we're not advocating creating competition with or replacing the, the Housing Corporation of Arlington, we get it that they do wonderful stuff. And so what we're talking about is increasing the town's capacity overall to do a variety of housing types. It's really hard to address housing needs in a nonprofit world when you've got one entity that's carrying that entire burden. So um, I just really wanna make that clear. I, somehow I'm gonna get this across in the plan too. We're not, we're not talking about um, creating competition for or somehow dismissing the importance of the AHC. We're talking about giving them more partners. And, and it sounds like also the role of the um, land trust would be to put together affordable home ownership. I, yeah, I think that really was what we had in mind okay. for that. Thanks. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Um, I know Joanne, you had your hand raised earlier. Did you have a question? Yeah. Oh, sorry, you're on mute. No, I'm not. Um, <laughs> I guess my general question, which I'm gonna partially answer is um, the comment that we're now in terms of affordable housing, it's fragmented and not well organized. Well, how did we get there? Um, uh, and I just want to quickly say, I'm on the board of the Arlington Housing Authority, which has over 800 units of, and houses more than 1,000 residents. We are low income housing, which means that um, we can take people from homeless shelters who have no income, and we take people who can no longer afford affordable housing. Mm -hmm. So we have a particular niche in terms of housing in Arlington. So one thing I wanna bring up um, is what's happened historically, especially since the Reagan administration, is there have been a major retreat from public housing and state and all kinds of funding of public housing. Um, I've become, since I've been on the board, a real fan of public housing. Um, and I think that it's been so constrained in being able to in create more truly low-income housing. So that's, um, that's uh, one thing. 
that I think is important to remember um, that we used to have, like in some of our units were built in the 1950s, but yeah. since then it's been, public housing has been defunded. One of the advantages of public housing is we don't have to pay profits to private de developers. Even nonprofit developers get 20% of profit so that all of the money that's put into housing, affordable um, low-income housing for public housing is spent on that purpose. Um, so I want people to become aware that that is an option in terms of all these other options. And it's a very organized one. Um, and it's one that meets the needs of the people who are the most desperate for housing, which are low-income residents. Um, and I had one other thing. Um, the other part of this is the big picture. The most profitable investment in the United States right now is in creating and owning residential housing. Just Google um, corporations, single family housing, you will find that there are corporations who own 300 single family houses um, and they make a lot of money on it. They can invest them. One realtor in Cambridge a couple of years ago put out a pamphlet which somehow came in my mail. They said that 300, over 300, I think it was 304, single family homes in Arlington were owned by outside investors. So I think it's very important to put this in the context of what is driving a lot of residential housing, luxury housing development. Um, so anyway, it, it doesn't need to be fragmented. Um, the Housing Corporation of Arlington has its own niche. We have ours, um, but I do think that there should be more emphasis on nonprofit and public uh, entities in terms of housing. Uh, that's it for now. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Joanne. Um, actually, uh, Neil, why don't you ask your question, and then we'll do the um, we'll do the next steps, and then um, if anybody else has a question, we'll go to that. Okay. Th thanks, Kelly. I, I just wanted to quickly say, and I I I, I don't want to speak too much, but um, I hear what you're saying, uh, Joanne, and one of I think one of the great regrets that I have about having been involved with affordable housing in Arlington for 25 years is that we have not been able to craft um, a relationship between the Housing Corporation of Arlington and the Arlington Housing Authority, and that we haven't been able to um, entrepreneurially work together. And um, I just, I, I would hope that uh, in the coming years that we can find ways uh, to maximize uh, the land that the Housing Authority has and the resources uh, that, that the Housing Corporation brings. So I, I agree, it's, it's a terrible thing in a town like Arlington to um, have two committed organizations to affordable housing. And uh, for any of the efforts for, towards affordable housing to be considered to be fragmented, we, should, we really need to, we can all work together. And I think I, I really hope that we can do that um, in the near future. Great, uh, thank you, Neil. Um, if you could just quick go to the next slide, Alexis. Um, do you wanna give a quick overview here of next steps? And then Jennifer, I see you have your hand raised, so we'll go to your question. Um, but just to understand the next steps. So um, Barrett Planning Group and Horsley Witten are completing the draft of the housing plan. Um, we will have that publicly available um, at, shortly after Thanksgiving. And then that will be available for review uh, through when that is presented um, to the Arlington Redevelopment Board. We have a presentation of the draft plan to the Arlington Redevelopment Board on December 16. The board at that time will have um, some time to review the draft plan and then come back at a meeting shortly thereafter 
and make some comments and um, approve the plan. At that point, it will be presented to the select board tentatively scheduled for Jan uh, January 3 in 2022, although we have to confirm that date. And then it would be presented to the select board most likely a second time for their review and adoption. And after that point, it would then be submitted to DHCD. But I do wanna be clear, like when we, when we have this draft plan, we will be posting this on the town website. We'll be sharing out um, through various communication channels that it is available for public review and how people can provide comments. So it is coming um, and we, it, you know, we really appreciate everyone's comments tonight. Uh, we appreciate everyone's working with us on this plan throughout the entire planning process. And particularly um, before we get to these next questions and if we end up closing before I'm able to say this, I just really wanna thank uh, Barrett Planning Group, Judy Barrett and Alexis, and also thanking um, Nate Kelly and Jeff Davis from Horsley Witten for their work on this. And also many, many thanks to the Housing Plan Implementation Committee for the many meetings that they have attended and um, the comments that they've shared in the drafting and of this plan and in the development of this planning process. So with that, I do wanna to go to Jennifer. I see you have your hand raised. I think what we'll do is um, we've got about 10 minutes for questions. And then I think in the interest of time, we should probably wrap this up. So thank you, Jennifer. Yes, thank you. Um, so I'm part of a group of people who um, advocates for more housing in our community, both more affordable housing, more middle income housing, more housing in general. And what I'm often struck by, I mean, on many, many occasions is how much sort of my anxiety mirrors the anxiety of people who I think are arguing against more housing. <laughs> so so the, the worry that our town is becoming unaffordable, the word, the look, you know, when you look at a smaller house that may be once affordable, torn down and built and a larger house replaced um, and, and feeling that that's changing our town and changing sort of um, what we value. Um, and, but, but where we often differ is what do we do about it, right? And so I, I don't think that continuing the process of exclusionary zoning, uh, trying to keep things small um, will do much in terms of preserving affordability, given especially that um, what houses cost depend a lot on the housing values. And so if you restrict how much can be built on that, that, that how, that, uh, sorry, the um, land values, if you restrict how much can be built on that land, you don't make houses more affordable. But, so, and I've heard this talked about as sort of the supply skepticism that people have. And so I guess sort of Judy or for other people, I'm wondering how, how can we talk to people who who I feel we like we often share the same concerns and yet we sort of have just sort of fundamentally different ideas of how to address these concerns but but we're all concerned about our town right I really feel like we're in the same community concerned about very very similar things all really caring people um but we just sort of differ on sort of how we fundamentally look at it and I'm wondering how we can talk to each other if you have any ideas Nate, I think I might punt this to you. <laughs> well, I was going to say, I think the, the idea that you're starting with the absolute simplest premises is really fantastic. But it is worth saying we all care about our town and starting there. Um, and then there are other, you know, and, and then you sort of just, you know, one baby step at a time. Um, so that that's sort of how you speak and what you're speaking about i think the other piece is that you know i think judy's touched on this a bit is you know providing places to speak often um and 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 so you know on the town side um that means you know educational material and, and uh, those capacity issues um that judy talked about and the leadership issues um you know and speaking you know checking it off and having all boards um, all commissions or all uh, groups, you know, talking about this at their at their regular meetings, and so you know, sort of weaving it into the culture. And even if people continue to disagree, the fact that it's happening again and again and again kind of takes the emotion out of it, you know. And and I think really helps with the tenor of the conversation. Um, I've worked in a lot of communities who. We do disagree a lot and disagree in a healthy way. It's just because they keep at it um, and they understand each other and they keep working 
you know, to try to find solutions. I think some of the things I heard tonight um, that was really interesting was, um, you know, there were there were folks who were drilling down on the details of some of this and, and showing how you would have maybe like a, a, an unintended bad outcome, sort of with the two family discussion that we had tonight. And so, you know, that those are great observations and really important. Um, but it's not a throwing the baby out of the bathwater kind of situation. So, you know, these things um, often take a couple of swings in order to get them to work. Um, and then when they do, you know, it's, you know, that's a great thing and maybe it's transferable to other places. So perseverance um, is really incredibly important for these kinds of things. You know, start out slow with the principles that you agree on. Um, you know, the, a lot of times, for example, there are issues where, you know, we, we, we talk about this a lot because if you notice with our firm, we're very environmentally oriented, uh, but we're also very housing oriented as well. And a lot of times, unfortunately, um, environmental groups and housing groups seem to find themselves at odds, um, but they really haven't taken a moment to talk about the things that they do agree about. Um, so I think I like, I love the fact that you know, Judy has asked us to talk about in the fair housing section, you know, the issues around open space and connectivity and healthy communities and these types of things, um, because that helps to get at other dimensions of housing that aren't often talked about. Um, so I do think there's a lot of room to, for people to agree on more things um, and just, you know, persevering, having leadership talk about it again and again, having the town continuing to highlight important uh, information so that the disinformation doesn't take root. Um, these are all things that, that have to happen to create a sort of a culture of conversation around difficult topics. I guess if I could just add one more thing, I, I think we agree on what we're worried about, but I think yeah. we fundamentally disagree on the solution that I feel like the solution is to add more housing and that other people feel like the solution is to restrict housing. You know, and but I think we are agreeing on, on what we worry about. And I have to just one more thing about the, what I agree with. I 100% completely agree with John Preston that the federal government has abrogated its responsibility towards affordable housing in the last 40 years. So I, that's another thing I completely 100% agree with. Um, but but I just feel like we are fundamentally at odds with what we think the solution is. I just do not think the solution is to continue to restrict supply. And I'm not sure. Um, how to cross that barrier with people who feel who see the single family being torn down to luxury two families being built and think that somehow increasing supply is a problem. And you know all the evidence, all the research papers say that's not true, but I just don't know how to cross that barrier in terms of communication. And I'm sure there are things I believe that aren't true too. So I'm just I'm just not sure how to cross that barrier. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I, I do think we all have a lot of many more conversations to have about this. Um, and it's not something we're necessarily going to solve tonight, but I do I do think we need to keep talking. Um, so I have three people here and then I think we're going to have to close for tonight. So um, just to name you all, um, Don, Len and Karen. Um, and just one quick correction I see on this slide here. Um, and I think maybe we could probably close this after this, but um, it's a submission of the final housing plan. And just to clarify, it's not the submission of the final housing plan on Monday, November 29th. It's, um, it's the sharing of the draft housing plan that'll happen on the 29th. So um, I think with that, we could probably close this so we could see everybody's faces a little bit and then we'll go um, Don, Len and Karen, and then we'll wrap it up for tonight. All right. Thank you, Kelly. Um, in the spirit of cooperation, I want to share with everyone here an easy way for any of us to immediately help the situation. Um, I recently found out, I think it was from Linnell Evans who's attending, about the Community Investment Tax Credit. And the Housing Corporation of Arlington is a participant. And what I found is that you can make a tax deductible contribution to them 
And there's a special program in which Massachusetts is going to give you a 50% tax credit on your contribution, which is just fantastic. So um, I recommend anyone who wants to make such a contribution to contact the Housing Corporation and find out the details of how you can do this. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, sorry, Len and then Karen. Thank you, Kelly. You know, uh, and so with uh, respect to the, the um, presentations to the select board, yeah, I think our next scheduled meeting, our scheduled meeting, first scheduled meeting in January is gonna be on the 10th. That isn't to say we can't do something on the third, but what I would like to suggest is that maybe we try to use the presentation of this plan as a opportunity to have a joint meeting uh, with ARB. And uh, the chair may have something else in mind, the chairs of both uh, boards may have something else in mind. So of course I defer to that, but I do know that I mean, there is a desire I mean, for both of those boards to get together. And given that the select board agendas can get pretty jammed at times, I think it'd be good if we had a separate meeting that was devoted to this and maybe other housing and zoning issues. That's it, thank you. Great, great um, meeting for <laughs> Thank you, Lynn. Um, Karen? Hi, thanks, um, Don. Thank you for uh, the shout out about the community investment tax credit. I like that you offered it in the spirit of cooperation. And if I thought it was at all productive to draw a line down the sand and say there's two teams here, I'd say we should have a friendly competition to see who can make more donations to the Housing Corporation of Arlington. So let's not draw that line, but whatever side you're on, I encourage you to be in touch with the Housing Corporation of Arlington. If you do year-end giving, there is no better tax benefit nor a better way to support affordable housing in Arlington. That wasn't what I was gonna bring up though. Um, feels like we want, like the, the market is a huge part of our challenge here, right? And we are a part of a regional market. We are not a market that as a town, we are a market as a region and uh, as a country and uh, as a globe actually, um, but, we can't really stick our heads in the sand, right? So affordable housing is about a math problem that doesn't work. It's about people who don't make enough money to afford the price of housing in our economy. And that's what we're working against. And it's really, really hard. And it's a math problem that doesn't work. And we talked earlier about subsidy being required to make it happen. And so I just wanna kind of, um, since I get to be the last commenter to ask about how we can think about our resources and which ones we can leverage. Because I think we're at a pivotal moment where we have a lot of common desire to create more affordable housing in our community. And we can argue about which ways and what levels, but we share that. And I would love to see us act on that. And we can find common ground to act on that but we do need resources. And we are a town that is heading into some challenging fiscal times. Um, and we have some resources at the table now that we could leverage. So um, I know that the town is already making some decisions about its ARPA money. I am putting in a plug to all of you to engage in the process of thinking about how those funds are spent because I don't know how we could better serve the people, um, the low income people who've been hardest hit by the pandemic than by taking steps to um, create more affordability in our community. But my question for you, Judy, is how do we best leverage those resources? If can, and are there ways that we can and that we are actually leveraging the market? Um, because for example, we may not love 40B, but guess what? We're about to get 60 units of affordable housing with zero subsidy from the 240B deals that were referenced earlier. That's no subsidy whatsoever. It's cross subsidy from the market. So the market take it, but it can be leveraged to give something back. Um, and it's one tool. It's not the only tool by any stretch of the imagination. I hope we won't take it out of the box, but Judy, how do we leverage the resources we have as a town? Because we don't have, we're not Cambridge, we're not Boston. We don't have the same um, commercial tax base to draw on, nor do we have um, the kinds of uh, entitlement resources coming from the federal government. And you also don't have the seasonal housing tax revenue that comes into places like Nantucket either. So, you know, I mean, realistically, I, I'm gonna say it's probably not gonna be very popular, but in a market like yours, you really have to think about, um, about, about the ways that mixed income development 
creates that cross subsidy. And so, you know, tools like Chapter 40R, which really doesn't necessarily require any subsidy. Sometimes developers will, will get a subsidy, but I mean, Chapter 40R rests on the assumption that mixed income will cross subsidize. What that doesn't do is get deeply affordable housing. So I think that there isn't going to be one strategy here that fixes the whole thing. Um, the, the sort of the, the moderate income group can be assisted with, with mixed in income type of development. Reserve therefore your resources, what the little you do have for, in, for providing for deeply affordable housing because mixed income development is not going to reach that unless you try a strategy of buying down, pardon me for getting into, you know, 40B nomenclature here, but buying down 80% units to something less. I mean, that's a possibility, but the need is in the most deeply affordable units. So I would say, you know, don't frustrate the ability of developers to do mixed income development because it's going to help to boost supply. Therefore, what you would be doing is focusing your financial resources, your land acquisition, your, you know, your free land as a result, you buy land, you make it available to nonprofits. Um, uh, you know, you're, you're throwing, you're putting CPA or housing trust funds into projects that are, that need that money to compete for low income housing tax credits, you know, focus that on the lower income need. And I, I think that you're going to need a multiple strategy here. It's not, you're not gonna do one size fits all in this town. You just can't. I worry the most, frankly, Karen, about the need for the deeply affordable housing because it's there. And I don't think the chapter 40, chapter 40B is simply a permitting law. That's all it is. It doesn't guarantee affordability. That needs money. And, um, you know, I'd, I'd hate to see the town kind of spending money on intervening in strategies that could get you 80% affordable units when I think the market can take care of that if you simply give them the regulatory tools to do it. I don't know if you agree with me, but I think that um, it's the deeply affordable housing where, there, where there's a real, real problem. And that's, I think, where you need to focus whatever you can on um, on using your own your own dollars to leverage state resources, such as CPA and housing trust funds being used for projects that need tax credits. That's just an example. I mean, I'm not sure that's a very helpful answer to your question, Karen. But to me, it's it's tiers of it's tiers of need, and different strategies work well at different tiers. Yeah, thanks. I'm, we're just looking for ideas and uh, yeah. I'm not committed to any one strategy. I think we need yeah. all the tools in the toolbox. Right. All right, great. Thank you so much. Thank you again, Alexis, Judy, Nate, uh, Jeff, um, uh, members of the HPIC. And thank you to everyone who came tonight and really engaged with this discussion. I think housing is a critical, and critical discussion in town and I think we're gonna continue to have it. Um, and we'll be in touch as the draft plan is a publicly available and we look forward to your feedback. So thank you all for participating tonight. And I look forward to continuing the conversation with you as we move into the rest of this year. Have a good evening all. Thank you. Good night.